And as far as knowing who is in Christ and why, Paul has to raise things in the gay church, so our unit coordinate is Axis J. It could be a slope of this in Christ. So now what we're thinking about is what if we have just a general unit vector U? And we'd like to know what is the rate of change of Z in the U direction? So we know what it is in the i direction. We know what it is in the j direction. What about u, some generic u, which has components a and b? Well, we can think about this. Let's look at this diagram here. So I have my original point, x naught, y naught, where I want to know the rate of change. And I'm moving in the direction of this unit vector u. And so if I wanted to calculate the rate of change, well, I could kind of estimate it in this way. Find the z value or the function value at my original point. Move a small distance in the direction of u and then calculate the new function value. And what I'd like to do is have a difference quotient, which would say, let me find the change in the function value and divide that by this distance that I've moved in the u direction. So that should give me an estimate at least for the rate of change, an approximation. Well the change in f is fairly simple, it's just a direct subtraction. I just calculate the function value at the new point, I subtract off the function value at the old point. This h, the way you can think of h is that I'm not going to move all the way an entire unit in the u direction. I'm just going to move a fraction of that. Well, the h is the fraction or scale factor that I'm moving in the u direction. And that's how I can say that, oh, okay, my new coordinates are going to be the original x coordinate plus this little bit of in the a component and then the original y. Uh, plus a little bit in the b direction there. So our distance moved in the direction of u, well I can just use the distance formula between the old point and the new point. And so uh, I can simplify that quite a bit because the x naught minus x naught is 0, y naught minus y naught is 0. And here I have a common factor of h, so let me go ahead and factor that out. And in fact, I can go ahead and take the square root of each part, and I'll have h outside the radical. And what's left over under the radical, radical a squared plus b squared, well, that's got to be 1, because that's the length of my unit vector u. And it's a unit vector, so its length is 1. So really, the distance that we've moved in that direction is h. The length of this hypotenuse is h. So an approximation for the rate of change in the direction of u would be this difference quotient. Pick some value of h, calculate your new function value, see what the difference is, and divide that difference by h. If you want to get a better approximation, choose h to be smaller. And of course, if we want our best approximation, then we take the limit as h approaches 0. Now, how are we going to calculate that? Well, let's take advantage of some of the previous things that we've learned. We do know that f at a new point is approximately the function at the old point plus this expression right here. Where did this expression come from? Well, it is just the tangent plane approximation. So by using the tangent plane approximation, I can approximate the function value at my 
new point. And more importantly, I also know that if the function f is differentiable, then I know that as my uh, delta x and delta y go to zero, that this tangent plane approximation comes arbitrarily close to the actual function value. So my delta x and my delta y in this case are delta x is a times h, delta y is b times h. And using this tangent plane approximation then, the difference that's in the numerator here is just the partial of f with respect to x times a h plus the partial of f with respect to y. So let me fix that. I'm not sure. Uh, times bh. And so what's nice about that is that now we've got a common factor of h. So when I write out my difference quotient here, now I can say that, oh, I've got the common factor of h, which can divide out. And so now when I take the limit as h goes to zero, uh, I just get what's left over which I can write uh, with the a in front, a times the partial of f with respect to x, plus b times the partial of f with respect to y. Now, you may say to yourself, oh, well, you had to use an approximation. Well, but in the limit, that approximation becomes arbitrarily valid, arbitrarily close. So this is not just an approximation, this is actually equal to uh, the limit value. So now let's take a look at this. I've got a times the partial of f with respect to x plus b times the partial of f with respect to y. In other words, I take two products, then I add those two products together. This can be written as a dot product. So the a and the b, those are actually the components of my u vector. And the other vector, which has the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y as its components, that is a very important vector. It's so important that it has its own symbol and its own name. So the symbol we use is this upside down triangle. Of course, we put an arrow over it because it is a vector and it's called the gradient vector. We may call it the gradient of F. Now, your textbook says that uh, sometimes this is read as del F. I have to admit that I, I never heard anybody refer to it as del F, but Obviously, there are people out there, so you should be aware that some people may say del f. I will just always say the gradient of f or the gradient vector. So now, what were we trying to do? We were trying to find the rate of change of z in the u direction. So this dot product will tell me that rate of change. And that's what we call the directional derivative. The rate of change of f in the direction of the unit vector. So we really do have to be careful. We cannot emphasize enough. Remember all of our analysis before relied on the fact that u was a unit vector. So this definition only works with unit vectors. It's called the directional derivative of f in the direction of u. And the notation that we use, because that's a lot to write down, saying the directional derivative of f in the direction of u at the point x naught, y naught. We write this as a big capital D. And if you remember when we first talked about partial derivatives, one of the ways we could write the partial derivative with respect to x, we could say the partial of f with respect to x, we could have written that with the capital D and the lowercase x. 
And same thing with the partial derivative with respect to y. So this is inspired by that uh, notation. So here we're saying we're taking the derivative of f in the direction of u at this particular value of x and y. And the way we define it is using that dot product. We take the gradient of f and dot it with the unit vector u. So let's find the gradient. We're just going to try to find the gradient vector of the function f, which is defined as x squared e to the power of y plus y times sine of x. Well, the gradient vector just has its components, the partial derivatives. So I'm actually going to get a formula here in terms of x and y. So the partial derivative with respect to x, first term just 2x e to the y, and then derivative of sine of x would be cosine of x. Take the partial derivative with respect to y, well the derivative or the partial derivative of e to the y with respect to y is just e to the y. And then the partial derivative of y sine x will just be sine x. So the partial derivative of f is just this expression here. We don't always put the x comma y, but maybe we should do it here since we're just learning. This is the gradient of f in general as a function of x and y has these two components. Now if I wanted to evaluate this at a specific point, say maybe uh, pi comma zero, well you know that tells me that my x value is pi, my y value is zero, and so uh, let me see if I did the evaluation correct. If I put x equals pi and y equals zero, well, the second term is just zero, e to the zero is one, so it'd just be two times pi. And in the second component, if I put pi in the place of x and zero in the place of y, well, sine of pi is zero. So again, I only get the first term, but now I have pi squared times one, pi squared. Now let's work out another example. Here we're going to actually calculate the rate of change. So it'll be a directional derivative of this function in the direction of the vector v, which has components negative 3 comma 4. And we're going to evaluate that at a specific point with coordinates 2 comma 1. So we're looking for a directional derivative in the direction of a unit vector. See, v here is not a unit vector. So u has to be a unit vector which is in the direction of v. But that's not a difficult computation. We've been doing that from almost day one of this class. We calculate a unit vector in the direction of v, v by taking the components of v and dividing it by the length of v. So the length of v is just radical 9 plus 16, which is 5. So I'll have 1 fifth times the original v vector. Now, I also need the gradient if I'm going to calculate the directional derivative. So the partial with respect to x of our function, that's going to be 4xy plus 3y squared. I'll need to evaluate that when x equals 2 and y equals 1. And so let's just see if I did that right. Looks like I'd have 8 plus 3 equals 11. Yes, good. Oh, I need the second partial derivative. So the partial derivative with respect to y for this function, 2x squared plus 6xy. Evaluate that when x equals 2 and y equals 1, and I get 20. So now the components of my gradient vector when x equals 2 and y equals 1 are 11 and 20. So I just need to dot that with my u vector, and I'll pull the 1 fifth out in front, dot 11 comma 20 with negative 3 comma 4, 
and that'll give me just a number 47 over 5. So that tells me that the, the surface, the z value of the surface, is changing at a rate of 47 over 5 units per unit direction in the direction of u. So it's rising in that direction. Well, there's more to say about the gradient vector. In particular, there's a very nice uh, geometric interpretation. Uh, but this uh, video would get very long if I did both. So I'm going to break this into two videos. And we'll do the geometric interpretation in a different video.